This episode of Long Night with Vish Khanna was recorded before a studio audience on Saturday, December 8th, 2018. Coming to you live from the Polish Combatants Hall in Toronto, Canada, it's Long Night with Vish Khanna! On tonight's show, journalist Anuka Mystery is here! We have composer Jeremy Dutcher on the Crowd, thank you very much for being here at the Polish Combatants Hall. How's everybody doing out there? It's nice to see you all. Thank you, James. Thank you to the bicycles. And please uh, make some noise for our first guest, Anupa Mystery, everyone. Hi. Hi. Thank you for being here. Thanks for having me. You are back in Toronto. I, I should am. say that, first of all. You are a renowned uh, journalist who... Uh, I know from here. It's weird, isn't it, that we're having a, a conversation in well, front of we've people? Been, we've kind of, yes, it, <laughs> and I, we've, we've kind of gotten reacquainted this year. So I saw you in Ottawa. That's right. And then, you know, I don't know, it's we've been nice. Seen, it has been nice because you were gone for a while after making a name for yourself as one of our greatest journalists, and, and I think James can vouch for that because James Absolutely. runs Exclaim Magazine. You used to, did you have like a formal role at Exclaim Magazine? I can't recall. I didn't. You didn't? Oh, God, this is awkward. I'm sorry. Super Why? awkward, Vish. <laughs> sorry about that. But you were like a prominent writer there, and then you've written for all sorts of people. I don't want to, do you want me to do the list off the top of my head? It's uncomfortable for me, so you <laughs> might as well. So let me think here. Let me see if I can do this. So Exclaim, uh, Now, CBC Radio, Pitchfork, the Fader. Who are we forgetting? Am I forgetting something? Globe and Mail. Globe and Mail. And it's spin. not just a resume time on the show. I just want to say you're very New good. New York Magazine. How, which one? New York Magazine. New York Magazine. Well, that doesn't count. We're in Toronto. But you moved to New York, and I never thought I'd see you again because you were a rising star. You were a comet floating across the sky. <laughs> and I fell back down to her. <laughs> Why are you back here exactly? What happened? Why are you back in Toronto? <laughs> I hope that wasn't too awkward a question. You've no. been very frank about, you know, what it's like to be a, a cultural creator I mean, these days. It's, it's, New York is not a great place to live. Yeah. It's a wonderful city, but it's, can I swear? You can, yes. Oh, it's fucking expensive. It is fucking expensive. I've, I've been there myself. It's yeah. not cheap. So, yeah, and, and, you know, you're in a volatile... We're all probably in a pretty volatile industry, aren't yeah, we? Yeah, and, and since I've been back and as I was hearing while I was gone, Toronto is also fucking expensive. So, yes. <laughs> uh, I don't know. But it's, you know, relatively speaking, it's less fucking expensive, so... Yeah, than New York, yeah. So, what does this be... What does it say about this state of cultural journalism that we're all because you're not you and I are not the only ones who feel like uh, we're burning out that there's some a lot of struggle involved in our practice like do you have a sense of that like having worked for very prominent American outlets and Canadian outlets what yeah, do you think's well, going on I mean I went to New York because I pivoted to video and I <laughs> you know decided to go work at Vivo and I guess that's what I thought I had to do, or what you think you have to do after you spend a lot of time writing for not a lot of money. Yeah. You'd go take your big city job, and um, yeah, it kind of wasn't what I thought it would be. And I stopped writing before I did that, because I was like, okay, I'm gonna focus on one thing. And it wasn't super satisfying, and I missed writing and talking about stuff that I actually care about, and not like Nick Jonas. I mean, I had a good time working there. It was great having a corporate card. Yeah. It's a very new experience. Right. But uh, that sounds really weird, but it's just like writing life is not very glamorous. Well, no, we, we, fr we, we freelance to get a job like that one. Yeah. And then when we get the job like the ones we've had at various media outlets, big ones. I worked at CBC with you as well. Yeah. And sometimes um, we find... 
What? Go, you said. Oh, I was just going to say, it's not all it's cracked up it's to be. It's not all it's cracked up to be, and you can't quite figure out why sometimes it's just not as satisfying. That's the dream. We, we, we write $20, uh, you know, articles. You know, we get paid $20 to write this article, and we hope we're going to work. Speak for yourself, Beach. Well, I'm sorry, yeah. <laughs> it's my lowly lot in life, I guess. Um, no, but no, we do this, I think, uh, ultimately to aspire for, to something like that. But you, I mean, I, I get the impression that even that wasn't quite enough for you. Yeah, it wasn't doing it for me. Right. It's also like, uh, this feels like it's, it's so, um, I don't know, granular to talk about, but it's just mm. all, it's so, you realize, I guess it sounds corny, but it's like the corporate structure is like really shitty to work within. Yeah. Um, especially at this point in time, it's just felt so weird living in America and not having any political agency, seeing, like living in a super wealthy city, reading the news every day and kind of being aware of like all of the inequality around you and not really being able to do anything about it, being kind of beholden to your job so you could survive in that city, seeing all of the despair. I don't know, it's kind of bleak, but um, yeah. it was just, I don't know, it made me feel really cynical and uh, that was part of the burnout. <laughs> so does it make you question, I mean, maybe this is obvious, but like you and I, I'm, I'm from India, my dad, my parents, are, I almost said just my dad, but both of them, my parents, are from India. And I grew up, I was first generation, and I grew up expected to be a certain thing. Uh, maybe a doctor, a lawyer, something that made money stable. Did you have that? Uh, no. I mean, my parents wanted stability. Um, and they weren't really able to model anything else for me. Yeah. Um, but they didn't ha They didn't do the doctor lawyer thing to me. They didn't. No. They, you were free to explore what you wanted to explore. Um, for the most part, yeah, yeah. I just that wonder, didn't really lead me to exploring anything that. <laughs> yeah, I just wonder if measures of success are tied to, you know, financial stability for yeah, you. Yeah, I mean, I think that's what it was. It's like I wanted the job because I thought like that's the thing that I had to do, and it, I'm very surprised now uh, at my lack of imagination. What do you mean? Well, that like I just was like, okay, this is the thing that I have to do. I have to have this career as an arts journalist, but it has to be very linear and conventional. Right, uh, right. It's just, I'm baffled by my own naivete, I suppose. Because I assume, like me, for one of the reasons you chose this path is because you didn't want to do something conventional. Yeah, I guess that's what <laughs> I thought I was doing. Right. <laughs> that, that, that is probably the, uh, the immigrant uh, yeah. like conditioning there. Yeah, yeah. Immigrant conditioning is, that's a good term for it. That's how I feel. I feel conditioned by the immigrants. My parents. <laughs> My parents are the immigrants that conditioned me, is what I meant there. <laughs> you were back here, and uh, you did start your own stuff, which I find interesting. You started a, a news. First, I, I got word that you started a newsletter, right? Yeah. And then a, a website of your own? Uh, no, the website was there. The website was already there. Yeah. So what did you actually start? What have you started of your own? <laughs> I'm just, just curious. Did a, just did a little newsletter. A newsletter. Uh, they're very hot these days. Yeah. Um, part of the reason I started the newsletter was because a friend of mine had been bugging me to do it for ages. And then uh, I made a little three-part podcast. Which is great. It's a great podcast. It's Thank on, you. It's on SoundCloud. It's called, it's, now wait, it's, the podcast is called Burnout. Yes. Is the newsletter is also called Burnout. Right. So that's telling in itself. What what is is there an umbrella like that's as an umbrella theme or title I should say. It suggests a theme. It speaks to your own burnout, is that fair? Yeah. Okay. It's pretty literal. So what when you talk to people, uh what are you are you asking them about how they're sustaining their passion? Yeah. I mean, you know, I had a moment this summer after I left New York where I just kind of everything came crashing down, I guess, and I was like, I don't know what to do, I don't know how to keep going, like, I thought I wanted this big job, I had it, it wasn't what I wanted, I don't know what I'm going to go back to Toronto and do, should I even go back to Toronto? And then my friend Shad, his, n his first music video for his new album kind of landed in my inbox, and I clicked it, and... It's called Get It, Got It Good, The Fool? The Fool Part One, Part one. yeah. yeah. And uh, I was, you know, having a sad day, and I just <laughs> opened the email 
because I was like, let me see my friend's smiling face. And I watched it, and it made me feel really good. Yeah. He's got a great smile. Shad has a great smile. He's a, a, a smile that lights up uh, the room. Yes. Um, <laughs> It's just what I think when I think of Shad's smile. It's a big yeah, smile. He has yeah. a big smile. So you see this video and it, it... It made me feel good and I was like, man, I don't know how Shad keeps going. This is his sixth album that he just put out. And, you know, he's been very successful, but he's also done a lot of different things. Host of Q on CBC Radio. Now he's hosting a hip-hop documentary series. He's put out Peabody like a... award-winning... Yes. It's one of my favorite things. He was let go from Q, and he immediately won the most, one of the most prestigious journalism awards you could win. He won the uh, Peabody, and I believe the show won an Emmy as well. Like, yeah. just highly lauded, and the, rec the new record's great. So you talk to Shad. Who are the guests on the, uh, the three parts? Shad is number one. Shad, Tanika Charles, who is a soul singer, and Sidani, who's S a rapper. Yeah, Sidani was, was Sidani with us here. I can't remember where Sidani... Uh, no, I was at uh, Workman Arts. We, we had Sidani on, too, and amazing, amazingly outspoken and thoughtful performer as well. So you wanted to talk to them about how they keep going, basically. Yeah, because I was like, I don't know how to keep going. How do these people keep going? And what have you discovered in talking to them? Any trends there? Anything that helped you? Uh, I think the conversations themselves helped me. Uh, I, I don't know if I would say that there is a trend. I think everyone has their own method of... Yeah figuring out like what they need to do to kind of keep themselves sane uh, when they have a creative impulse uh, and it's different for everyone. I think, I don't know, faith kind of came up a lot, which was surprising um, and I'm interested in that. I think we don't talk about that kind of stuff a lot. Religious faith? Or just yeah, I mean, it didn't come up explicitly, but it was like referenced mm -hmm. and I'm not mad at it, you know? I think um, that's uh, just, I don't really see too many people talking about that uh, in the art space, I think. Yeah. Um, and it's cool, and I think we're kind of in a moment right now where people need something more. Yeah. Uh, and I think it's okay to, to, t to have room to talk about that stuff. That seems to be what... This show, by the way, it's, it's only going to be three episodes? Is that the plan? I don't know. You're already burnt out on your own <laughs> yeah. burnout-themed podcast? Well, it was also like a thing of, I wanted to do it all myself, right? Like, yeah. I have been writing and producing for other people for years, and I'd never, like, just been like, okay, I'm going to, like, take some initiative. I'd never taken initiative right. um, and done something all by myself. So that's, it was just like, okay, I'm just going to do it. And, you know, people were like, you should apply for a grant you should market it this way. And I was like, I can't have any of that stuff because if I think about it too much, I'm not going to do it. I just needed to like do it, three parts, put it out, and like, like I don't know, sit back. Well, you're not the only, if, for what it's worth, like, I don't, you're not the only journalist or you know, broadcaster going through this stuff. I mean, I talked to someone over the summer who said that to me about the fact that I have a podcast and just said, you do your own thing. That's amazing. Like, I wish... Because I was talking, I'm like, I don't really pitch as much as I used to when I was younger, like to different outlets. I just gave up because I don't really find it satisfying because you might write for a giant outlet, but then they send you that check for $10 American for your story in the AV club, and you're like, why am I doing this? What was the point for, of this, really? Except that I assume, like me, you're driven to do this by something kind of intangible. There's some passion within you that drives you to this field, I would say. Do you not agree? I know you're a, a bit of a pessimistic person. So to, is that fair? I don't know if it's fair. Cynical? Skeptical. Skeptical, sure. Use another of the same kind of word. Um, I feel like, you know, that's a hard thing to reckon with. Like why Realistic. Am I, realistic. I, I don't, when I think about what it, the stuff I do, it's just I do it because I know I need to do it. Shad on your podcast says that. I know, and I have the exact same philosophy. I wake up. And I know I'm going to feel better if I make something or create something. That's my day. If I don't do that in a day, for whatever reason, I don't feel good. Like, I don't feel as good about myself. And I assume you've come to that realization a little bit in this process of, like, I do this because I love doing it. Yeah, I mean, I do this because I love doing it. I, I do love writing and I miss writing. And uh, this is also a way for me to kind of, like, do stuff and take a step back from writing publicly so I can write for myself. Yeah. I think that was another thing that kind of came out of this. I've been writing for 
other people or for public consumption for so long, I kind of just stopped writing my own stuff, yeah. which is kind of scary uh, when you like realize you can't just pick up a pen and write down a thought. Like it kind of got like a little extreme for me. I don't know what that was about. And mm. so I was like, I need to like, I need to cultivate a safe space for my writing. And so the majority of the writing I've done this year has just been like me and my laptop. Does this no mean else. you don't want these people to go to your site and read your stuff or sign up for your newsletter? Like, can we tell them where to go? You've just, already told them. Did I? Well, you've already told them that it exists. It exists. That's yeah. enough. They have to Google. People have Google. They have. You have. You guys say. Do you guys use Google? <laughs> Maggie is clapping. Only one person knows how to use Google. You should Google how to use Google. It's really handy. Uh, tw- we're running out of time, unfortunately, but you're going to stick around for the rest of the show. But. Uh, I have here in my one, I have notes this week, this month. What? How often do you do the show? Semi-regularly. Semi-regularly. I have, I have a note here. Key 2018 moments or figures. I think of you as someone who's very, you know, discerning, ear to the ground. You, you keep tabs on pop culture, although it does sound like you kind of stepped back a little bit this year. Does anyone come to mind or any moment stick out for you in terms of this year? Because it's December. It's almost 2019. Anything? That's a, it's really broad. I know. I meant I left it broad. That's why the note said it, it doesn't say this. But yeah, keep it broad. <laughs> Is that too much? Did the whole year? This, what did you want? Yeah. What about in April of 2018? Who was the best <laughs> person? I don't know. There's nothing. Like what? What made you happy in 2018? I'm. What made me happy in 2018? It's another weird it's way of asking the same question. Shit is unexpectedly like invasive. <laughs> I told you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're right. I'm sorry. I didn't mean it that way. Not at all. No, I just figured, you know. I was, okay, I'll, I'll give you like an honest what made me happy in 2018. And it does involve a person. Um, I went to Detroit last weekend to visit my friend Mike, who is a Detroit techno pioneer. And I met him when I was at the Red Bull Music Academy in like in September, October. And was that the day you and I were there to see Alice Glass? That no, no, no. Oh. I was in Berlin oh, for, oh, Berlin. Sorry. yeah, sorry. Yeah. Um, and he was one of the studio mentors there. Okay. And meeting him, I think, was a personal highlight of 2018 because in a year, I think, when I'm like grappling with a lot of questions about how to go on and what's the point and the world's on fire he kind of embodies the spirit of like you just got to keep doing what you got to do and you got to make you know where you live uh, a great place so mike banks okay person is my year. person of 2018 well uh for what it's worth you're doing great work still and i uh, also you're not alone in your doubt and your confusion thank you if that does that help <laughs> totally i'm cured All right, mission accomplished, everyone. We're going to take a quick commercial break, and when we come back, Jeremy Dutcher will be here. How about a hand for Anupa Mystery? We'll see you in a moment. Hey, this week's episode is brought to you by Pizza Trocadero. For my money, the best pizza you can eat in Guelph, Ontario a proud independent family business run by a punk rocker, Trocadero only uses a rich array of fresh ingredients cut by hand and homemade dough made daily, all baked to perfection inside of a stone oven. It's gourmet panzerati, calzones, wings, salads, garlic bread, breadsticks, and oh man, the pizza, the pizza. Personally, I like the gourmet domateo with goat cheese, artichoke, roasted red pepper, mushrooms. I sub out the turkey breast for eggplant, but that's just me. Wash the whole thing down with a brio? Man, I am getting hungry just talking about this. Call Pizza Trocadero at 519-829-2444. Visit them at 7 Municipal Street in Guelph and online at trocaderoguelph.ca. T-R-O-K-A-D-E-R-O-G-U-E-L-P-H dot C-A. That's Pizza Trocadero, a place of the good trade. We're back on a long night. It's uh, nice to see you all here tonight. And uh, without further ado, how about a round of applause for the winner of the 2018 Polaris Music Prize, Jeremy Dutcher. 
Hi. Hi. Welcome. Welcome back. Where, where were you earlier today? Were you in a different city? Or? I was in a different city. What city today? were you in earlier in today? City, the great city of Montreal. Montreal, Quebec. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How was that? Life changing. Why was it life changing? Oh, did you have a bagel? <laughs> <laughs> Truly, no, but I did have some, uh, some good smoked meat and poutine. Did you hear about um, iced tea? Having a bagel for the first time like a week or two ago? So I thought you meant the drink iced tea. No, no. Did you hear about a glass of iced tea <laughs> becoming sentient and then just eating a bagel in Montreal? I want all of it that. It was crazy story. Well, uh, no, but really the no the, the rapper the, iced the artist tea. iced tea. Yes, the artist yeah. iced tea declared on Twitter that he'd never had a bagel and everyone lost their minds. And then he was like, "Fuck! All right, I'll eat a bagel." So he ate a bagel and then he tweeted it. And then I don't know. Trump probably bombed somebody, and we were all focused on this bagel Smoke thing. and mirrors. Yeah, it was you know. bread and circus, literally. Anyway, uh, <laughs> you were in Montreal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 That was so, super cool. Uh, I did a show at the Maison Symphonique, uh, which is this beautiful concert hall with this uh, cellist named uh, Yo-Yo Ma. <laughs> yes. not sure if you've heard There's of him. There's a photo on Twitter. Can we uh, show them the photo? You can't, a technical... you, we don't have that technology. Can we? we? Can we get a photo of Jeremy with Yo-Yo Ma on the screen? <laughs> Maybe everyone here can pretend it's behind me and cheer oh. like it's... Look at that. Look at those two. Maybe I can show you on my phone. We need more money for this show. I'm <laughs> telling you, it's just... Anyway, there's a photo you of you. Just, you can check it out. I, yeah, just, I can't remember uh, my passcode. Let me tell you, this, this man is like... Yo-Yo Ma? No one else I've ever met. What, how so? Well, I just think... Um, so, for example... He asked me to come, he was doing two and a half hours of Bach cello suites, which like, first off, bold move. <laughs> Just him and the cello, no one else, for two and a half hours, no intermission, nothing. Um, well, there's always room for cello. Yeah, truly. Yeah, yeah. And they ate it up, everyone was loving it, and then asked me to come and sing, the on, sing an improvised encore what? with him. What? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yo-Yo Ma uh, invited you to yeah. sing? He's been following along, I didn't know. Really? Him. Yeah, big fan. Oh my fan. goodness. Oh, that's amazing. Um, he's really into like uh, field recordings. Oh, he of said course. there's three. <laughs> I came to find out there's three things that we both have in common that we love, which is uh, field recordings, uh, craft beer, and the city of Halifax. So you hung out with Yo-Yo Ma? Oh yeah, yeah. We had a whole night. That's amazing. Um, but but sorry. To my point, um, <laughs> we were. Uh, I, I was asked to come do the encore, and usually, you know, I'm playing with a piano, and I have loopers, electronics, and they said none of that. Yeah. And so, uh, because they were doing this live stream at the church down the street. And so he said, oh, you know, he really wanted his guest artists to have the best experience. So he said, well, what we're going to do is we're going to go to that church that they're live streaming at before the show, give them a concert, give them like a 20 minute something, and then go to the concert hall and do the show. So he like totally went out of his way to like just make it a better experience for like the people. Anyway, he's, he's, just, ha he's having an interesting time. Didn't he give a free concert at a subway station? He did as well, yeah. Was that in Montreal? It was in Montreal, indeed. He just set up shop and that's yeah. incredible. And he's doing a lot of talk about like AI right now and the, the sort of intersections between um, technology and, and, and music. And oh, so, wow. Um, yeah, he's, he, you know, he's been pioneering a lot of ideas for a long time, but I think uh, it was just so amazing to meet this like icon and, and realize that he's just as much of a child as I am. Well, it's, you know, you had, I would say you are one of 2018's big newsmakers. I mean, that goes without saying. You've had a tremendous year. And how are you feeling about this at this point? Like, we're at the end of the year. It's, it's December. Like, I mean, obviously the Yo-Yo Ma story maybe is exemplary of this. Like, what is going on sure. in my yeah. life right there now? There seems to be an alternative universe that's been entered. And, <laughs> and for some reason, people are listening to what I have to say. Um, no, I mean it's all it's all quite recent, right? Like this with this with this record, which is called. Oh no! I, I never said I could pronounce <laughs> it. I just said I could s almost spell it without James, looking. can you can we're, you try to pronounce it? I'm just no, curious. No, we're, we're not going to we're not going to do, do this to me. You going to do this to me right now? I didn't do that to you. No, no, you no, no do I wouldn't do me. that to you. Uh, but anyway, what is Stoyevic? Look to Waganawa. Pretty close. Really? I love that there's a Vic on the end. It's very like it's very Serbian. Yeah, I got Serbian. I was listening back to our interview that we you and you were on the show back in July, and I spent time with you just trying to make sure I pronounced it right. Yeah. And so on the drive here, I just kept saying it over and over, and you know, to remember, and I fucked it up. 
<laughs> I fucked it all up. It's I made okay. It Even like when I type my language on Twitter, sometimes it's like translate to Romanian. Right. I'm like, oh, you on. say it, and then yeah. I'll. Well, so, uh, we to Yeah, see, that's not what I was saying on the car ride over here. Not yeah, at all. It was close it's already on. in my brain wrong you know, now. The important thing for me is that people are actually trying. Yes. That's, and, you know, that the, is there, there's a symbolic nature right. in that, I think. And, right. and so for me, um, you know, this is my first record. It took me five years to create. Yes. From the research to the composition to the to the uh, like recording, so yeah, I, I think it feels very sudden for a lot of people, but I've been, sort of been spinning wheels you, for a long time trying to get this going. We covered this on some level that you yeah you've been working on this for five years. It's a bit of a trial and error process. Lots of research, or it's a research oriented record. Well, it didn't even start as a record. I'll be honest. That's with right. You. It yeah. was just like an anthropological Dig. response yeah. almost. Yeah, for to sure. To what was going on. Like, we talked about this as well, the fact that field recordings uh, in retrospect now are viewed um, as both tremendously helpful but also problematic um, on, on, on both levels. So um, yeah, what I was gonna say though is, yeah, so you put out the record in this, I wanna say the summer. Was yeah, it? I think it was April, actually. April, right. That's why so when you said April, I was like, please pick me. Please pick me. <laughs> April Hi. of 2018. It's nice to meet you, though. Yeah. That was the highlight of the year for Anupa. Yeah. I think we figured that out. So uh, no, 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 but it was in April. Yeah. So it came out in April, yeah. and then um, you got shortlisted, and, or rather longlisted for this prize, yeah. then shortlisted. Then you won. You won the prize. And I, how unexpected was that, first of all? Did you really think you had a shot? I mean, I know this is an awkward question because you don't want to sound... Braggadocious, but did you think you had, I just threw, can cool. you pronounce braggadocious? I should Tough guy? Yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> no, I, I didn't mean to pull that uh, uh, out there, there. It was, was like, no, of course not. No. I think for me, as, as, a, as a complete outlier and somebody that's not making music in English or in French, yes. or, uh, and making music at a very bizarre intersection, sonically yeah. speaking, yeah. of classical and traditional and, and, and you know. And so it's I, a I really challenging record, and I, you certainly, know, yeah. yeah, I really wasn't expecting for that level of recognition. Um, because, you know, you think about the past winners, people like Buffy St. Marie, Tanya Tagak, um, Final Fantasy, you know, there's so many legendary people that have taken this, yes. uh, have, have won this acknowledgement. So, um, of course, it's not the reason for, for why any of it exists. Um, but to, to win prizes. Yeah. yeah. You know, I, I, I do it for the, for the money and the recognition. <laughs> you just need a trophy. I need trophies. Yeah. That's you know what? No trophy. Let me, let oh, me, let me talk to whoever at Polaris <laughs> is here. No trophy. No novelty check. Yeah, you didn't even get a novelty check. They, That's what they, I'm, well, well I, heard that, I heard that Owen Pallet got the first novelty check, and it was just way too big. Yes. You know? And yeah. so they just never did it again. No, they did. Uh, I think oh, fucked, they did. fucked Up got one, yeah. too. Yeah. For God's sake. Yeah, sorry. I don't mean What, they just got rid of it for my year, then? They got rid of it for That's you. That is bad. What I wanted to... Nothing. Nothing. Just a, just a sad, you know, bump in my bank account. Well, <laughs> yeah, I'm we should kidding. all feel pretty it bad It was gone for, immediately, by the way. You. Yeah. No, what I was going to ask you, though, is yeah. on some level, this was a gradual ascent, and then something happened. Yeah. Uh, you've been touring and doing stuff. I'm just curious, and I've never been able to, to talk to someone who, within a year, roughly, went from a relatively obscure person to one of our country's most famous on some level. Personally, I know, I know, I know, I know. I mean, you celebrated, know I mean. celebrated, and you know, I think at the, when all this stuff co- you're on the cover of Exclaim magazine this month, if I might plug James's magazine. It's Great true. article too by uh, by the, the amazing Anishinaabe ch- uh, or violist and writer uh, Melody McIver. And I saw you perform um, with. Amazing. That's Shout right. Out. Yeah. I saw you perform with Melody in Ottawa back in February. That was that's, such a special that show. It was an for amazing me. show at the yeah. National Arts Center. Unbelievable. My point. Yeah. You went from relative. I just wonder about you personally, dealing with this. This people are asking you to are you talk. Just checking in. I am in front of no one. I'm just checking in <laughs> to make sure so you're sweet. okay. No, seriously, that's a weird. That must be a strange thing. You're a public person, and you went from. I, I like people work and they play and they yeah. perform and they want to be big, but you you're big to me now, and and uh, not that you weren't big when we. You're big. You're always big. <laughs> Don't don't sell yourself My mother short. used to say husky, actually. Husky, oh, yeah. I didn't mean it that You're way. You're just husky, I honey. I didn't mean it that way at all. This is yeah. all going horribly. <laughs> no, no I, I, you know what I mean? I what, the transition point, I from like, yeah. you know, I'm just doing this to see what it is. Now you're, yeah. What, what's that been like, personally? Uh, I think I come from a very, very small place in the East Coast. And anonymity was never really an option in these communities. And so when I moved to Toronto four years ago, it was like... Uh, 
it was nice to be like invisible for a minute. Right. Um, to be able to move through the city and just to not think about how you're presenting and all this stuff. So yeah, yeah. I, uh, this city gave me a lot of freedom and allowed me to sort of come into the next self. And, um, and that was through um, solitude a little bit. And so now that's kind of gone. Um, it's gone, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, I was actually on my way here on the, on the subway was somebody, uh, Carol. Carol was surprised that I was schlepping it on the subway. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> just, like, just like common folk. Right. I'm like, you know, what else am I doing? That's oh. a, that, honestly, that psychologically, that must be weird. I, yeah, for strange. me, I'm so like, I'm, I'm so... Um, I know you're grateful, <laughs> I think, aren't you? Uh, to who? <laughs> to me. No, yeah, I don't mean to me. mostly to no, you. No, I mean for the success. I no. mean, I know you, this is something you aspire to what, on some level. What the success does, it allows me to have a platform to talk about issues that I want to talk about, yeah. right? And for me, I think there's undeniably a lot that needs to be discussed currently, uh, both with, within the history of this country and also with the very dangerous place we are going. Yes. I, I, you know, <laughs> I'm taking time to talk about this in every interview because I am getting obsessed with the ecological collapse of this place. It is the only home we have. And so it, it, it boggles my mind that we, you know, have a, even in this country, have a prime minister that, that extols virtues of, of reconciliation and, 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 and is still buying pipelines at the end of the day. We suffer from collective short-sightedness uh, than we have for decades. And Truly. it's catching up with us finally. I mean, some of us. I mean, <laughs> it's unfortunately, yeah, it's, you're right. You're right. So I think so much to dodge your question on no, how I'm doing. It. No, no, um, I, this is part of it, though. You, you did, you won your prize. Oh, that's why. You, you that's won why your prize. Yeah. You went up on stage. And what did you remember exactly what you said? I know it's been <laughs> paraphrased and quoted. You mentioned that we are, are you ready what? for the indigenous renaissance, I believe, is what you said. Uh, you're in the midst. You're in the midst of it. Of That's right. See, I screwed it up. <laughs> That's what you said. No, don't worry. I even screwed it up when I said it. You, On the stage. And 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 in an indigenous renaissance. An indigenous renaissance. You must uh, have been a bit yeah. overwhelmed that you just won. The, Truly. Well, you didn't get the uh, big check, but you won something. Yeah. You the, must have been the, overwhelmed. But why? But you immediately wanted to mention this, and that's telling. Yeah, and it's not a term that I had thought about particularly at all, it just kind of flew out. And, and for me, it was really just naming something that, for me, was kind of obvious. You know, I look, at, I look at all of sort of the cultural categories in this country, and what I see, anyway, is indigenous brilliance, and, 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 and artists that are, that are really saying something that um, can transform this place, and, and transform how we live in this world. Um, so um, you didn't even have to use the sign that no. time. Like that yeah, that's nice. That's it's nice. Jeremy, uh, the issue is I'm the only one here who needs the sign. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone else garners yeah. and earns their own applause. Yeah, yeah. This is just an insecurity Strictly. blanket that I carry around with me in the form of a sign that says applause. <laughs> <laughs> Truly. The way so, I am. But anyway, I, you know, I'm, I was, you know, I said it and then immediately I was like, oh shit, like, what does that mean? Like, what are the layers of what I just said? And it's really funny, actually, in the article that Exclaim just put out, they're talking about the indigenous renaissance, and they quote my, an elder of mine um, named Maggie Paul. Yes. And she says, the first line she says, I don't know what renaissance means. <laughs> right. <laughs> but when he, when he got up on stage and said that, it made me remember that we are here, and we have always been here, creating music that speaks to this place. So for me talking about a renaissance and, and, and specifically using the word mist because I do feel like um, the Canadian media landscape has tried to paint this as a very new thing. Yes. Um, which I think really betrays the lineage of, of indigenous creation in this place. Yes. So people, you know, people like Buffy St. Marie who's been talking about issues like in a big way since the you know since the 60s have you read andrea warner's new book yes. about buffy it's has ever so. anyone here read andrea warner's new book about buffy st marie by chance because if you haven't you definitely should because no. this is a true pioneer there's just stuff in there that you i yeah. had no idea that buffy was you know into the things just like a soothsayer kind of like yeah. knew what was coming and kind of was trying to deal with it in the 60s and 70s and here we are now as you say yeah, we're on just the brink finally of, circling back you know and i don't what's wrong with us why are we so <laughs> dense i know why i'm so dense but why why can't we clue into this ecological collapse and 
within that, I mean, you say that there's efficacy in what's going on in this indigenous renaissance. I mean, who should we be listening to? How do we fix our problems? Please, Jeremy, for the love of God, well, <laughs> help, help us, us here. I don't know uh, what to do. I don't know who to talk to. There's got to be something we just, to be done. We need to do less talking and more listening, yeah. I think, at the end of the day. Um, you know, I think what this project and touring this record has allowed me to do is, is to enter different spaces and s different communities that, that maybe have not thought about what it means to actually engage indigenous concepts and identities yeah. and, and ways of knowing and being. Um, and what that actually sounds like and, and, and blow apart people's preconception of what indigenous music even is, you know? Um, I had somebody come up recently and say, you know, your music doesn't even sound indigenous. <laughs> and I was like, what the fuck does that mean? Yeah. Um, you know, I think, yeah, people definitely have a very prescribed notion of what you should look like or what you should sound like or what you should be saying. And I think for me, I was very, very fortunate to grow up um, and be, be lifted up uh, by a community that allowed me to say and do what I know is true. Um, and, and, you know, that's what this whole project has been about, is going back to that archive and, and, and creating these pieces. It, it's been about connection with that community, and yeah. they've really um, pointed the way and guided me um, through this process. So it's been cool. Well, I, think I, I, I have a question. Oh, may sorry, I, yes. may <laughs> I have, ask a question? Of course. Uh, I'm curious about uh, at Polaris when you won, if there's... Uh, like a community of winners, uh, if you got any, if anyone pulled, if Tanya or Owen or Lido or anybody, any yeah. of the previous winners kind of pulled you aside and said, okay, <laughs> shit's about to get crazy. Yeah. This is what you can expect. This is like what, you know, sort of the arc of things might be. Did yeah. you, have you had any kind of communication like that? You know, I, I, I was very, very fortunate to have already existing relationships with Lido and Tanya and and they've been they've been so supportive. I think, you know, obviously going through this is is a whirlwind. And you know, I haven't really I've maybe had four days in this in this city in my own bed since September. You know, yeah. and so it's like it, you can't really be prepared for what it's gonna be. And even I think everyone navigates it differently too. You know, and so some people's solution is to, to go out there and, and say as much as they want. Other people is to, is to retract. And, and so for me, I think some of the advice that I was given was just to, to remember balance and to, to know that what you have to say is of value intrinsically because, because of who you are and where you sit at these intersections of identity um, that haven't been heard for a very long time. And so I think um, we're now coming to a place, you know, not even just within our own communities, but, you know, uh, societally, uh, where these conversations are being had. Yeah. And, um, and, and, and not being had about us, but finally, you know, including us as part of the conversation and an integral part of the conversation. Yeah. So I think, uh, yeah, um, Definitely, I've had to, I've been able to lean on like a, a a wonderful community of of artists and and, and thinkers and people that are really um, pushing dialogue forward. Um, and for me, that's yeah, I can't ask for more than that. And these you know these are people that I've idolized, you know you know. And so it, again, it 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 feels like finally being invited to the grown up table. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I'm, I'm I'm here for it. Well, you I deserve stick it. Around. I might say you deserve it. Oh, you deserve thank to be you, at, Fish. This is not the grown-up table. This is, no, this is absolutely the kiddie table for <laughs> not sure. A, not at all a grown-up table. When we spoke in, I want to say it was July? It feels like July. You said you were... I, I asked you what was next, because your record had been out a while. Yeah. And you what said did you I were, say? You said you were demoing a new record that uh -huh. might be partly English, yeah. and that you didn't know where that was going. Do you have any updates on that? <laughs> Still demoing. You're still demoing that record. <laughs> no, uh, well, that is that is both exactly true and also not the whole truth. You know, I've been um, tour has been really, really extensive, and um, I, I'm finally, you know, 
I sort of created this record without a band. I I was the band, you know. I was a, I was I was playing the drum, you know. That's right. For all of the demos for this first one, I was playing the drums and writing the shitty synthy string parts and then the piano. And um, so this process has been the first where it's been like I have like a, a trio yeah. that I work with, and um, we've been creating arrangements together and creating sound worlds um, in a new way. So um, it's been exciting, but it's also been evolving, you know. Um, I mean, I've, I know you're busy, but the the one of the things that intrigued me was the Partly English. Ah, uh, yeah. Is that still the case? Well, you know, I can talk it okay. <laughs> you're doing, <laughs> you're doing pretty gooder. gooder. Uh, no, I, no, no, no. I, I see what you're saying, though. and it is a total departure for me. That's what I mean. Uh, uh, it, it, the the previous record was not in English, and no. this one you said you made a point of saying this one might actually be a little bit. There might be some English, and yeah. Well, for me, there was a there was a very important. Um, point to do the first one all in my language. Yes. And that was a very um, specific orientation to say that this is for my people yes. at the end of the day. Yes. This is not for what it turned out to be, you know, <laughs> yeah. uh, as it goes. But um, I think there are so many stories that need to come forward. And, and, and the more ways that I can tell that in an accessible way. So if it has to be in English, then, then I think that's a direction we can go. You know, I think I, I'm never going to stop singing my language because I no, think no, yeah. it's very much a part of, of, of my artistic statement and what I want to say because, you know, um, where our language sits right now, where it's, it's so, um, comment dit-on, um, vul not vulnerable, but uh, precarious. I like that word. Let's just Linda, let's the applause with lady with the big words. Uh, it's, at a, it's at a rather precarious, precarious place, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, and so, you know, there's less than 100 fluent speakers left. That's right, yeah. Um, and so for me, it's like I don't have time to like be doing anything else but worrying about my language every day. Mm -hmm. um, but if we insist on making me sing in English. Um, <laughs> no, I found these beautiful poems by this, um, by this uh, Cherokee poet from, from down south. Um, and they were really talking about the precarious place that our women find us I themselves see. at. I see. And so I think specifically around missing and murdered indigenous women, there's a lot that needs to come forward and needs to be said and, and represented. Um, and so this, those poems tackle that reality. Um, and I think for me, that's, that's the next direction. Um, singing, uh, yeah, singing in English is weird, and too because you know, with with this first album, all the melodies were very prescribed. Of That's course, right. they were based on these old recordings, That's and right. so, so the, in a way, the the cage has been opened, and and these melodies can kind of go any any which way, and they do. <laughs> um, so, uh, <laughs> so uh, we'll see. I'm very very excited for it. Uh, I think it's not. I can't foresee this coming out, maybe even not in, in 2019. No, 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 and I, like you said. Stop been, trying to rush me, please. I'm not rushing you. You, you, you. you toured extensively. I just wanted a bit of an yeah, update. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I just found that striking in the summer, that that's yeah. where you were going. No, it's, it's, it's been evolving, and I, I think I'm, for me, I just see my role as a storyteller, and, and for me, um, the, the site of the archive was one specific story, um, but I don't want to be the archive guy for the rest of my no, career, no, yeah, you know? So yeah. I think finding other ways to tell our stories and to bring those narratives forward is very um, important for me. And I'm hoping that, yeah, people will still be listening. It's important for all of us, if I might say, on behalf of the people here, and I, I want to thank you for being on this show and for chatting with me again. A real pleasure. And putting up with me yeah. and my stupidity. Thank you very much. We're just going to take... A very quick break. Jeremy, you're going to come back for a little panel discussion at the end. We're going to take a quick break, and then Lee Reed joins us for a conversation. Stick around. Jeremy Dutcher, everybody. It's nice to see you all here. How about another round of applause for Jeremy Dutcher? That was fun. And while you're clapping, keep it going for our next guest from Hamilton, Ontario, Lee Reed, everyone. Lee Reed. Thank you, Lee. Thank you, Vish. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's nice to have you here. Now, you are, I said you're from Hamilton. You That's came, right. You came in from Hamilton today? We did. We did. Me and the homie Crime One. Do you, do you come to Toronto often? Uh, too much. 
No, no I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no, o- often, yeah, I'd say, yeah, at least once a month, well, probably. I, I ask because over the last decade or so, it seems I keep hearing news reports and magazine cover stories about how people from Toronto <laughs> are moving into Hamilton. That's Anybody right. Anybody here from Toronto but live in Hamilton? No? Okay. Thank you. It's this, Thank you. Uh, don't believe the hype, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Hamilton's been swallowed by the, the property bubble in Toronto. So is that what's going we're on? We're basically the extreme west end of Toronto now. <laughs> what's ha- is it bad? Is it a bad situation? Oh, it seriously is, yeah. Yeah, I've lived in the downtown since the, the mid-90s. And, uh, you know, it was probably, it's, it's mostly happened in the last 10 years. But in the last sort of five years, the rents have almost doubled in the, in the downtown core where I'm staying. Um, it went from bearing, uh, being a very affordable place to stay to a very unaffordable place to stay. We used to, everybody had jam spaces and yeah. homes and second jam spaces or studios and stuff. So, yeah, it's a really strange thing that's going on there right now. Now, do you, is it because of Toronto people coming in or what's... Oh, uh, not exclusively, no. No. I think it's, you know, it, it really was it, it was, it was undervalued probably compared to a lot of the region. It was just sort of a matter of time before it equalized. And I think what was painful about it was that it, 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 you know, got pulled into the sort of what everybody else was in southern Ontario or that area was probably paying yeah. too quickly, you know. Right. Uh, it was very jarring. We went from having a lot of vacancy rates to having very low vacancy rates and, and rents almost doubling, kind of like that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, one of the reasons I, I wanted to have you on the show beyond talking about that stuff is that, uh, for those of you who don't know, Lee is uh, certainly one of my favorite MCs going and very politically outspoken and, and socially conscious, which is, it's rare to see someone uh, put that much effort into that. Uh, and you're also, are you an anarchist or a nihilist? I'm, I'm, I'm an anarchist. You're an anarchist? I'm, okay. I'm an anarchist, yes. How does that manifest Ooh. itself? You, you uh, explain your anarchy to me. I don't quite understand what all the kids are doing with the anarchy. I, well, anar- anarchism means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. And there's different ways of, of practicing it as a, as a form of politics. But mostly it just means that I believe in uh, that essentially nobody's in a better position to govern you than you, uh, you and your community. Uh, your community is the best equipped to decide what should happen to your community. Uh, and the closest that we can get to that sort of form of governance is ideal. So what does this mean in terms of things like voting in voting. elections and whatnot? I typically am against voting. Yeah, I No applause. <laughs> <laughs> Can I you hold the applause? sign up, please? No, I'm just kidding. No, you it's, don't. It's, you know, it's, we, we've, we've talked about this before, and I, and I think that my, my position on this is changing in the age of guys like Trump and Ford. Yeah. And I think that if I lived in certain places that I might consider voting, I sometimes vote municipally yeah. in Hamilton, uh, depending on what's going on. But I'm typically of the mind that uh, political engagement isn't something that should occur in a ballot box. It's something that you should be doing daily, and it's something that you should engage in, that you should be helping to steer where your community's headed. Yeah. You should be helping to defend your community. You should be helping to build your community up. Uh, and I think that voting is kind of takes the, the wind out of that. I see so many people get wrapped up in uh, sort of uh, campaigns around, around candidates and around candidacy and around voting. And I just watch them, and I just think, if you just sank that energy into tenant organizing or you know, transit organizing, a lot of what it is that you're, you're trying to get out of politics, you would get you know, if you just struggled in your community instead. Well, we talk a lot about uh, voting complacency, and that usually means that people aren't com- showing up to vote. But I think what, what my reading of what you're saying is there's this feeling that, OK, I voted, I'm done. Mm. I, I, put, I voted and I don't have to do anything else. What I think you're saying beyond don't vote, which <laughs> we already talked about this and I don't agree with that but myself, but I also understand where you're coming from and I get frustrated. It's, I'm surprised at myself for believing in the system as much as I do, you know, for yeah. actually going and voting because sure. I'm like you. I'm very cynical. I'm like Anupa. I'm skeptical. I'm cynical. <laughs> uh, all those things. But I do think voting is our only way of making a difference. But what you're saying, I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, it shouldn't stop at the voting. You should it, get it involved in your community. Not. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I, I've, I've sort of amended that, like I say, in the age of Trump and Ford. It's hard for me to defend that position. But what I see historically and, and even in the short term is that 
pressure from outside of the ballot box system is what really changes things. Right. You look at um, how uh, big changes occur in history. It doesn't occur by a candidate deciding to put his hand on the pulse of culture and come up with something that is like cool to do and we'll vote on that. Um, the closest to that, I guess, being weed with Trudeau, I suppose. Sure. You know, but these are kind of inconsequential things to me. Um, but look at the, so, and I know that it's, a, it's some dispute, but look at the American election, that just the midterm election. Yeah. Was it, it initially, it took a while, but it ended up being the blue wave that everyone talked about and a lot of the <laughs> right. slate of those candidates, and I know you're cynical about all that shit, and you yeah. have every right to be, but some of those candidates are, you know, they would share, I assume they have elements in their platforms that you agree with. For sure. And they have energy, and they seem connected to mm -hmm. actual grassroots movements, mm -hmm. and now they've been installed because yeah. of this wave, or whatever you want to call it, it's a media yeah. construction, but they've been installed and now in a place where they can actually have efficacy. Mm -hmm. Does that give you pause? Does it give me pause? Not like in so terms much. of what's happening here? Um, yeah, no. <laughs> I mean, like, listen, the, the IPCC report is being retooled every sort of few months, right? Yeah. Like, uh, a little while back, we had until 2100 until there's no civilization. I think now they're giving us to 2040. We need a radical re-alteration of everything there is to do with our politics, economy, and society in the next 8 to 12 years. Waiting on election cycles isn't going to change that. That's fair. And it's not something that... We're not at the point in history where we can be like, yo, you know what? We've got this blue wave coming by the time we get to, you know what I mean? Like, no, 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 no. The People blue need wave. to start organizing like, like, you know, security of food, security of water, security of their communities. And we need to start yeah. looking at things outside of the kind of the, the left and right ballot paradigm that Yeah, I have. think what you're saying is the blue wave is not enough to stop literally <laughs> blue waves that's right, that's from right. coming in. The and tsunamis of yeah, actual it's blue. it's really awful. Yeah. Talk about, you've got a, uh, one of the other reasons I wanted you on is because you made one of my favorite records of the year, oh, if I might you, say. Man. It's called Before and Aftermath. It's out on Strange Famous Records, yeah. which is amazing. People should go to Lee Reed's Bandcamp page uh, to check out this album, and you're going to be playing songs from it right. uh, later, which I'm excited about. Can you, I guess, briefly tell people what, I, I, I'm aware of some currents, some themes that run through this record. If you could encapsulate, for, encapsulate the record for people who may not have heard it, what would you say? Well, it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's called Before and Aftermath. It pictures that we are in the midst of the sixth mass extinction, as we are, and uh, it's sort of... Have a good Saturday night, hey, everybody. There you go. Hang um, out with the cheery twins <laughs> up here. That's right. Let's go have a beer. Yeah, I'll... I think we're just sort of got our, our foot on the gas pedal speeding into the, uh, to the abyss. <laughs> um, yeah, no, it's, it's sort of trying to acknowledge that we're, we're actually in that process. We are yeah. actually in the process of the collapse of civilization while we're still just going on like everything's fine. Right. I guess that's really what it comes down to. And there's yeah. a satirical aspect to your rhyming, uh, and there's an angry aspect to it, but it's completely compelling. I feel like I'm, I'm getting an... It feels informative, Thank you. I might say, and, and the beats are amazing, as people are going to hear, and I, I'm very happy that you're here. Um, we're going to take a very quick break, if that's cool. Of course. And we come back, uh, Jeremy and Anupa and Lee will be up here. We'll have a very brief panel discussion. And as we did last month, if anyone here would like to supply us with a topic of conversation, just shout it out when we come back from the break. Please think of it. Are you guys okay out there? Are you all right? <laughs> okay, good. We'll be back. We'll be back with more on Long Nights. Stick around. Thank you. <laughs> back on Long Night, and uh, thank you once again for being here at the Polish Combatants Hall for Long Winter and Long Night. Uh, and how about another round of applause for the guests on the show, Lee Reed, Jeremy Dutcher, Anupa Mystery. Thank you so much for being on the show. All right, so uh, we have a few moments left here, and I thought we'd open it up to the floor for uh, topic suggestions. Who has a topic suggestion? Anarchy. Anarchy? You want to talk about anarchy. Okay. Well, Lee, you spoke on it a little bit already, I suppose. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, Sorry, everyone. Why don't we find out if, if Jeremy or, or Anupa relate 
to the concept of anarchy particularly? Uh, Jeremy, do you want to... How do you feel about it all? Anupa, how do you feel about anarchy? Do you believe in anarchy? Can you believe in anarchy? <laughs> no, it just exists. It's, it's like air How do you know water, it exists you know? if you don't believe in it? It's so confusing to me. Would you relate I, to anarchy? I don't relate to anarchy, but I did relate to some of Lee's ideas. I, you know, I think voting matters, particularly in this day and age, and I'm not into people who say they don't vote. Um, but I do really uh, believe that uh, real change comes from the community and the ground up. So sure, I don't know. Is that anarchy, yeah. though? No. It can be. An- yeah, anarchists, so- anarchists are community organizers. Okay. Yeah. Okay. True. Jeremy, do you relate to anarchy? Um, I would say that, that the change that does need to happen will be fundamental. Hmm. And I think society always goes in flux. Um, and to think that we can even understand the scope of, 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 of true human history is naive. Um, and so to, for me, this, you know, you talked about the sixth cleansing. We have, we have lots of prophecies as well, you know, that talk about um, how we need to come together and, and how that's the only way um, to the unity of people that um, we survive in this place. Um, and so now is a very, is a very important time within, within that idea um, that, that the people have come on this continent for a reason um, and that we're all bringing our gifts to each other and that if we come to understand it in, in, a, in a good way um, that respects each other and this place then it could be entirely f- like shift everything and which is what is required um, and so, um, whether or not that looks like an, you know, an anarchy situation, I, not to speak on this, but, but I will say I think the shift will be fundamental, mm. you know, and um, unless it happens very quickly, I think. Uh, do, do you think, Lee, you're, you attend uh, uh, protests and you, you work with people who are kind of on the fringes of political movements, like, do you feel like anarchy has actually had efficacy? In our contemporary society, like, does it actually impact? Like, has it impacted? Yeah, things? yeah. I think it's. It would be. I think people would be surprised to find out how many of their um, their uh, social movements, either locally or on a sort of massive scale, are actually low key run by anarchists. Uh, most of the sort of um, the stuff that I work on in Hamilton. Uh, from like tenant organizing is what I've been really focused on the last couple of years. So I work with a group of uh, tenant organizers, helped work with the, uh, a bunch of um, uh, tenants, organized a, a rent strike in the east end of Hamilton. In the, yeah, uh, East Hamilton rent strike, Stony Creek Towers. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, we, don't, we don't walk around talking to the newspaper about the fact that we're anarchists, but uh, because we know that it gets kind of bad press, but yeah. uh, you know, you'd see the same thing here in Toronto. Um, I, you know, I don't, I don't want to throw shade at any organizations, but most of the places that I work with, uh, yeah, uh, at the core of that organizing uh, uh, is, is definitely a, a lot of anarchism. Okay, uh, and it's, eff- it's effective. I would say it is, yeah. yeah. I think anarchists work, uh, most anarchists I know get more done by noon on Monday than the rest of the world will this month, you know? Uh, they work Wait, hard. Wait, are, uh, are they Marines? <laughs> <laughs> no, they work harder than Marines even. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, they, no, they, they, they really do. They, uh, the, the folks that I know that, uh, that, that do that type of work, that do that type of organizing, uh, it's, it's not a, a Tuesday night thing, you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, stakes yeah. are high, yeah, yeah. Okay. I would agree. J- James, do you want to chime in about the anarchy? <laughs> uh, I'm I've never, I wonder if, if anyone's anar- ever said that. Do you want to chime in about the anarchy? <laughs> I'm, I'm wondering if it doesn't need a rebrand. Because I think, that anar- I think that a lot of people think of anarchy as there are associations maybe of violence, but specifically mm. about uh, an aggressive individualism. Sure. Yeah. And you're talking about community organizing. You're talking yeah. about local concerns. You're talking about, yeah. uh, you know, really more of... Um, it's a think local, act local philosophy yeah yeah uh, but i don't think i don't think that the what people associate with the term anarchy is sure. what you're talking about as 
uh, an active political movement. Right. So I'm just wondering if maybe uh, you, if, if me, you, you and the gang could get together and talk about <laughs> some, some new, find a brand manager and, uh, you know, maybe, uh, yeah. maybe do some, uh, some work on that you, area. You want yeah. Anarchy well, to have a business meeting? Yes. Yes, I do. Okay. But what They're already you? organizing. They're having yeah, meetings no, it's, already. It's interesting. But it's so right to, to always bring it back to community, though. And I think mm. um, when you look at movements like I Don't Know More, like in a way is an anarchistic movement. Absolutely. You know, it was taking that's up space, I, that's what I'm doing round at. dances yeah. in, in, in public space to, yeah. to, to, to say that enough is enough. I think I, I, I didn't mean to make horrible jokes about it. I actually feel like the, the basis of any progressive movement is anarchy. I really feel like it's upsetting the convention yeah. and, and, and that opens people's eyes. Whether they agree or not, mm. it usually brings ideas to the fore. And that's all I'm saying. Like, I actually yeah. feel like this moment we're living in, as much as some of it's shit, I mean, yeah. a lot of the more idealized stuff that's going on, I think, springs from the free thought that is involved in anarchy. That's all I'm saying. We are in the midst of an indigenous renaissance. And I find that I really believe that, and I think it was amazing that you said that. Yeah. And I feel like anarchism, to me, is very congruent with supporting indigenous solidarity and indigenous resistance. As a settler here, I find that it's a way, I mean, when I was on tour this past year, we stopped in at the site of the, the Tiny House Warriors. We, I've, I've been out to Wet'suwet'en territory, the Unistoten camp, uh, and I find that like my interface with with indigenous resistance has been through the anarchist community in, in southern Ontario has connected me to all this. Yeah. And uh, that's, to me, you know, uh, as close to decolonizing politics that I've ever seen is yeah. these people that practice this as defaulting to the community that was already here, the indigenous community that already existed. And that's in many ways, in, in here in southern Ontario at least, that's how it's practiced, I find, or at least that's the ideal. You know? It's very well said, Lee, and uh, I, I'd like to ask you to accept that as your final word. You got it. That was great. Anupa, Jeremy, do you have anything you want to say before we say goodnight? Anupa, do you have anything more you want to say? Did you have a good time? It's all right. That's fair. That's how I feel, too. Jeremy? Um, you know, we're, we're closing out the year. Do you want to say one final thing about 2018, which is, you know, I know it was a shit year for you, but still... <laughs> it's, re it's really on the spot you know there's too many big things to too say too many big things too many big things to say but gratitude is gratitude is that's what I was um, going for and respect so we have uh, anarchy gratitude that's yeah, alright alright that's our show we have to go thank you so much for being here on Long Night Lee Reed Jeremy Dutcher Anupa Mystery James Keats The Bicycles I'm Mish stay tuned for Lee Reed live on this stage talk to you next month Happy New Year. Bye for now.